Remember the good old days of the 90s where every company was trying to come up with your own hero mascot person thing to go up against the likes of Mario and Sonic? Remember how most of these up-and-comers like Bubsy or Radical Rex or whatever crashed and burned so bad to the point that mentioning their names can bring up trauma most foul? Believe it or not, there were actually some hidden gems amidst the pile, be it animal or human caricature. Sadly, they were just featured in one or two video games before they faded away into obscurity. So, let us raise our glasses for these lost heroes in video game time and tell you why these guys were cult favorites. Let's start off with perhaps the very first game done by Game Freaks, aka the Pokemon guys. You control this teenage superhero named Pulseman, who can charge up huge amounts of static electricity by running really really fast. Not Sonic fast, but close enough. He's got a flip kick and sweep to defend himself, but the kicker are his pulse electric moves called Volt Tagger Techniques. He can throw flash arrows and turn into a ricocheting bouncing ball of death. It's a pretty handy power to have since the alternate earth he's in currently relies so much on technology, much like today when you think about it. Guess Game Freaks was ahead of the curve in clairvoyance. Anyway, every part of the game plays around that mechanic, be it reaching onto a high platform by ricocheting across the screen, or tackling bosses by figuring out the best trajectory to launch yourself into. You even transmit yourself through wires and cables to get from one point to another, and the whole internet cyberspace realm is, well, look. I don't think that's how India looks like. The North American market only got a taste of the game through the online only at the time Sega channel service. Naturally, the service wasn't a huge success as the online infrastructure and gamers at the time weren't really ready for such luxuries. A shame too, this game is worth playing, had no strict language barrier and is available on the Wii Virtual Console service. So yeah, that's really no excuse to replay this sucker. But hey, you get to see the very first Game Freaks title before the company went swimming in ungodly piles of money from their virtual monster cockfighting franchise. You think video games can mimic silent movies? Well, you'd be wrong because R.D. Lightfoot for the Super Nintendo did just that with his sole game. The entire tale of R.D. Lightfoot and its search for fragments of a wish-granting MacGuffin is told like a pantomime and also showcases the power of interactive storytelling rather than shoving cutscenes and non-interactive machine mouths in your face, like most games these days. The actual game ain't half bad at all. RD's tail acts and bounces like Scrooge McDuck's cane in the DuckTales games. You know, the Nintendo one where he was on the moon looking for treasure that raging about the fowl, and a penguin called Pack that serves as both an eater of minions and a temporary mode of transport. Each level in the game introduces new twists and gimmicks not repeated in other stages, making each visit unique though we have to confess that the controls take some time getting used to. As developer SCE combined both gameplay and narrative in a smooth manner, we also kind of hard to believe that this gem was published by the same guys who subjected us to this. Lord, I need a shower. Ugh. Good old Sonic team had a lot of scraps and drawing board concepts revolving around creating Sonic the Hedgehog. One of which was a rabbit that threw stuff at bad guys with its long arms. A few years later after Sonic came out, the devs took said scraps and built Rise Star, a 2D platformer where you control a shooting star with stretchable limbs. He kills bad guys with a sweet headbutt, because while well, stars are made out of insanely hot rocks from space, and can fly around like an actual shooting star would, as long as there was a vertical pole handy. You've got your usual underwater, ice and volcanic levels as per the platforming genre staple, but even those tropes had some neat little twists, like the ice level having walls that are too slippery for Rise Star to grab. The game also introduced a cheery and dynamic soundtrack evolving music level and a metallic cyber level complete with its own brain twisting maze. Each stage has its own unique gimmick that makes every visit feel fresh. Boss fights get creative too, ranging from killing robo armadillos to tossing curry into a giant ice yeti's mouth. Yes, that really happens. Coupled with great production values in graphics, animation and sound, one wonders why this gen never got the attention it deserved. Speaking of stars and presentation, Sunsoft was one such company revered for great games with high production values, and gimmick was no exception. Before even Half-Life and PC gaming taught us how physics add to fun and challenges, gimmick did just that in 1992, on a friggin' 2D plane for god's sake. Our little hero charges and shoots out a star that not only kills things, but also acts as a makeshift platform. You'll need to practice throwing a single star just right so you can leap onto higher platforms, or just kill multiple enemies within a single stroke. Or just bounce it off to hit enemies in tough spots. 
And good golly, if this game isn't the prettiest and most detailed game on the Nintendo I've seen within that era, then I don't know what is. Unique stage gimmicks that don't repeat themselves, locations outside of the usual lava slash ice slash underwater level staples, and some vistas and rest spots for players to admire the view, this is what we call a huge labor of love from developers, people. If I had to point out the critical fault, is that accessing the final stage and happy ending is balls out hard, and requires death star shooting skills to access platforms and such. But I digress, gimmick will make a platforming man out of you. It's a crying shame that it never saw the light of day in the North American market. Someone at Konami had the brilliant idea of taking the Contra lead developers and giving them the task to create the company's own mascot animal platformer. The result is a fast-paced action game called Rocket Knight Adventures. Your character is an opossum, no, no, not that waste of space, yes, yes, this fella here, an opossum called Sparkster, and he uses a rocket pack to blaze and charge through stages to destroy barriers, pigs, wolves, and snake men with extreme prejudice. The levels and boss fights for the three games, two Mega Drive titles and one Super Nintendo game, were built so that players take advantage of Sparkster's rocket boosting mechanic. Plus, the aesthetics of the game blended in fantasy and steampunk perfectly for a unique look that makes it stand out among the mascot platformer action game crowd. Each of the three games feel different. The first one on the Genesis and the Super Nintendo were reliant on reflexes and twitch factor, given the speed at which you blaze through each stage. The sequel on the Genesis had bigger expensive areas and introduces the auto-charge mechanic for Sparkster's rocket pack, at the cost of making Sparkster move like he came out from the goddamn moon. Regardless of which version you pick, you can expect them to wow you with its inventive levels, challenging bosses, and insane rocketeering action. Sorry recent Rocket Knight game on the XBLA, PSN, and PC. You may be dressed in all shades of steampunk level nifty, but you cannot top the originals. Ever. Keep in mind that these are just a few of the characters we're featuring on our video, as there's probably a boatload more that we have yet to mention. So, got an underrated character you want us to talk about? Tell us in the comments box below.